the Compendium Podcast, hosted by Leadership Books. In just moments, our host, Michael Stickler, will be joining us with a very special guest. Before we get started, I would like to introduce you to Michael. He's a four-time best-selling author, philanthropist, publisher, and highly sought-after conference speaker. His passion is to see life-changing books find their audience. Books that will change your life, change your business, and change your soul. And he specializes in helping authors and business owners achieve publishing success. Won't you please welcome Michael Stickler. Well, thank you, Ron, so much for the great introduction. As Ron said, I'm Michael Stickler. I am the publisher at Leadership Books. And today we have another incredible author, great guy, a guy who has learned some great lessons that he wants to share with you and, and the public. And his name's Dave Parker. And Dave um, began his career at age 24 and served as a student of the San Francisco Inner City Public School District for over 40 years as a music teacher. And he also did 10 more years as a volunteer. Wow, Dave, that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, pursuing a career in education, Parker also became a successful real estate investor. Oh, okay, a little, little something on the side besides teaching school, I like it. And, it was spent, and he spent 20 years as a member of the Berkeley Symphony, Symphony Orchestra and 15 years as a leader of Dave Parker Sextet. Um, so he's an accomplished musician as well. He's headlined at San Francisco Fillmore Jazz Festival and um, they tell me he's a pretty amazing uh, jazz musician. But today we wanna to talk about his book, Income and Wealth. Now, as Dave's book approached publication, Dave was already at work on his next book and thoughtful essays have been featured in The Economist and Financial Times and several other prestigious law journals. In addition to being an author, entrepreneur and investor, Dave Parker is a proud, proud father and grandfather. And Dave, I, I know what you're talking about. It's amazing to be a father and it's even more amazing <laughs> to be a grandfather. So Dave Parker, welcome to the Compendium Podcast. Thank you, glad to be here. So Dave, tell us a little bit about the whole idea of income and wealth, your book, Income and Wealth. Um, define, maybe start out by defining the difference between income and wealth, and, and then maybe share the whole big idea, maybe the story about how you got here and wrote a book. All right, but income and wealth has two main ideas. The, the, the public seems to, to jump on idea number one, which is that income and wealth are two separate matters that one can be a, an artist, one can be a school teacher, one can be a, open a, a restaurant, they don't always do so well. One can do what they really want in life and not worry about their, their income, what their salary is, because financial independence, which is the goal, is a completely different matter. And that comes from saving half your salary for a period of 10 years. It's easier when you're younger. And make and purchase income producing assets with leverage. At the end of 10 years, those loans pay off, the rents go up, and you'd be surprised you are completely financially independent at that wage. And I give an example of a minimum wage employee at McDonald's. I do almost an Excel spreadsheet, penny by penny, how it works. And uh, that McDonald's employee will be financially independent at that wage. A person earning much more will be independent at that wage. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to work. And they're free to be whatever they want in life. So at the end, using that methodology, so what you're saying is using that methodology is at the end of the 10 years, they're pretty much uh, no longer need to work. They've got a nice income coming in from their investments and they're living at the wage or at the lifestyle that they were living at originally. And they can keep working. So all of a sudden they're, they're doubling. If they, keep, if they keep working at McDonald's, they have a double income now. 
Right, right. So it's, how did you come across this um, idea? I, I know that you're a real estate investor yourself. Is, is that where you kind of learned this? Or tell us kind of, um, you know, the genesis of, of your book. I can tell you the moment when I began to really think about this. Age 12. I'm sitting really? at, the, at the breakfast table with my parents and I grabbed the newspaper, pretending I can read it. <laughs> and there was an article um, about a waiter who died in the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, a big famous hotel. And they tore apart his room and they discovered, this is in 1950 something or other, he was a multimillionaire. And I go, what? How is that possible? He's just a waiter. And I just couldn't get that idea out of my head. And he and they found stock certificates all hidden under the mattresses and drawers everywhere. He was just buying regularly buying stocks with a part of his salary. It took me a while to figure that out. And then, then the next insight was my first year teaching school. And I'm talking to the custodian. There's a great guy who worked comparing Italian and French cuisine, we're debating over, <laughs> we're talking Pavarotti. And then he says, you know, I love coming in to the school in the morning. I turn the heat on, I talk to the early morning teachers and early morning students, but I'm not doing this for the money. I own four apartment buildings. I just love going to work at the oh. school. I go, what? <laughs> I said, yes, that's what I'm talking about. So I started to started to write about it, right? My day. Oh yeah, then I went into real estate and my first year in real estate was the uh, oil embargo of 1974. Right. And the cars were lining up to buy gasoline. Interest rates had jumped from five to 11%. You couldn't, I was, I couldn't sell any property. I was just learning to sell. And then I, uh, one of my clients, I was trying to sell his house, he says, I'll give you a note for this thing. I'll take over the loan. I'll give you a note for the balance. He says, fine. Mm. I go, oh, <laughs> I just discovered the leverage buyout. There it is, the leverage buyout. So I'm just saying for someone who's not sophisticated, just buy every year, buy the house next door. Next year, buy the house next door to that. Don't worry about what it costs. If 10 people are willing to pay that price, that's what it's worth. If you're not interested in real estate, if you know something about trucks, buy a few trucks and start Amazon delivery service or buy the corner store. Every year, buy one. 10 years from now, you own 10 corner stores. That's all. You don't have to be sophisticated whatsoever to do that. And how you mentioned the, the, the fella when you were 12 and they found out he's a multimillionaire. Do, do stocks um, fit into this? Yeah, no, he was a, he purchased stocks his whole life. He must have been 70 or 80 years old at the time. And every year he must have been, must have been purchasing stocks. So he had stocks that he purchased 50 years ago when, right. he, when he had died. And they probably, and uh, so that's not 10 years, that's 50 years worth of stock. Sure. The thought that, that uh, I dropped the paper, <laughs> that was amazing. That really spurred my imagination. I bet. Now, you told me in the pre-interview about you You live there in the San Francisco Bay Area. And when you first started investing, you, you recognized that so many immigrants in the community owned real estate. Um, tell me, I thought that was fascinating. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I realized that when I started to sell real estate, just like a simple salesperson, no different than anybody else. And all the owners were... Uh, Italian families from Southern Italy or Asian families from some province in China didn't even speak English. Mm. And they owned all the apartment buildings in town and all. I said, how is that? Because they knew, I guess, from their rough childhood, that's what you do. You come to America and buy some real estate and don't think twice about it. And the banks uh, were, they loaned, were, uh, A.P. Giannini, the head of Bank of America, started in San Francisco. He says, I know you, I know your father. <laughs> I'm going to make you a loan because I know that you're a, a Southern Italian or wherever it is, and I know you'll pay that mortgage even if you don't have food on the table. And then the Asian banks did the same for the Asians. 
we know you'll make that mortgage. You don't, you can't speak English. You don't even have a job. And I don't know where you got the money. You're not putting very much money down anyway, but I know you'll make the mortgage. We're not worried about it. Um, that was a great insight. They knew, they knew without knowing anything to do that when they came here. And the proof is this, <laughs> all the buildings in San Francisco, not all the buildings, but so many buildings are owned by uh, uh, non-English speaking, uh, uneducated people. Right. Amazing. Right. Amazing. And Dave, um, what about, you know, I, I have a friend who just recently inherited I don't know, hundred thousand dollars. What? What would? How would you advise that person? Has no investments, has no uh, income, just working a, a regular job, but all of a sudden had a bit of a uh, cash flow, uh, or I should say, a, a windfall. That's the word I was looking for. Um, how would you advise that person to to take their hundred thousand dollars? What should they do with it? Buy a million dollar building, quick, because they're going to end up spending that money before they realize. So you use it just, just as a down payment and go buy a million dollar building and then- Yeah, or buy a million dollars worth of trucks or buy a million dollars worth of corner stores or, or, or a million dollars worth of stock if you know, if you know what you're doing. Mm. It's, it's harder to do with leverage though. Right. And, and when you say you don't, it doesn't matter what it costs, why do you say it that way? Because you're not a professional investor and you're gonna, and every year that you postpone because you think maybe it's too high, um, you missed, and that thing went up in value probably. So, 10 years from now, if you overpaid 10% for something, it just it doesn't even register on the chart. Right. Something, That's even if it just only doubled in 10 years, that 10% difference hardly registers on the chart. Just go right. buy it. it. Yeah. If you're buying the house next door and, it's, and 10 people are willing to pay a certain price for it, that's what it's worth. You don't have to think any further. That's what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see your point. Now, when you're writing your book, Income and Wealth, um, what happened in the book in your process of writing that kind of surprised you? Um, you'd mentioned earlier that you had written it and then you went and um, did some more research and then you, and then you rewrote the book. But tell me a little bit about the writing process and what you discovered about being an author. Well, every writer should have some a spouse <laughs> who looks at this and says, my wife says, I think you better take a class in economics. So, so I went back to school, from Golden Gate University in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want to learn how to make money. I want to learn how I made it. And she said, okay, we got the professor for you. And uh, I just... Uh, I started with a graduate class because I have a I have a master's degree in music and I have a degree in French. I figured I'm going to start as a master's program. I walked through that class. I go, I can't do this. I better take economics one. <laughs> so I went back to economics one. Then the algebra they're throwing at me. Wait a second. I better take another review algebra. So I took every class in the catalog in math and economics and government. 67 units in a row, starting at the age of 50, something like that. Wow. Then I wrote the book. Now I, now I know, at least from that perspective, what I'm talking about. Right. Coupled with my experience in business, which, sure. which is, is vast, is vast. So why did your wife tell you to go take an, you know, better take an economics class? What did she see in the book? It just didn't, it didn't, wasn't convincing. Oh, Okay. It just didn't sound like somebody who knows what he's talking about in uh, economics. I might know what I'm talking about in money, but uh, this book is a, it's a scholarly book. I'm a somewhat rare in that sense. I'm, a, I'm a writing on political economy, um, scholarly writing on political economy from an entrepreneurial mind. And I haven't seen books like mine on the market. Right. My example of income of a McDonald's employee, that's just a concrete example that people jump on because it, it appeals to everybody. But right. most of the book is a scholarly book on the timeless laws of money and why government should not intervene in the economy. Right. Very good. Very good. So now that you've written your book, 
and you've been successful at real estate investment. What's your future look like? What are we doing right now? Well, I've been, I have a, I've actually written five books, but this okay. is the first one that got published. And the second one is coming out in, in 30 days. It's, uh, um, it's entitled A San Francisco Conservative. Hmm. I was going to put in, in parentheses. Is that possible? That, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not that conservative. Everybody says, no, no, it's funny. Leave it alone. It's understood. Right. I'm, San Francisco. I'm not some right wing nut, as you would, one could say. Right. And I have four sections of that book. The first one is very serious what classical conservatism or classical liberalism is, which is the vision of the founding fathers. And uh, I open up with a quote from T.S. Eliot. Time past, time present, time future, it's the same. Aristotle talked just like we talk right now. If you read his works, you they'll drop the book. You can't believe it. He sounds like us. He talks about all the issues we are, we care about only much better. <laughs> that was a very sure. high moment, very high moment in, in right. the history of mankind. Wow. Well, Dave Parker, um, what great insight. I'm actually going to apply <laughs> some of what you've shared with us today in my own life. Um, folks, you want to make sure that you get Dave's book. You can find it at Leadership Books. You just click on the link right below, or maybe it's up above. I'm, I'm not really sure, but it's here somewhere on the page. His book's called Income and Wealth. I recommend it highly, especially if you're that person who thinks that they just don't make enough money to start investing and to start putting uh, uh, their future aside today. Yeah, what a great book. Dave, I want to thank you very much for being with us here on the Compendium Podcast. And until next time, folks, next Monday and Wednesday, we put out another great author, an interview with another great author who's got some great ideas to share with the world. Until our next episode, may God bless you in this wonderful day. Thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. I do hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And be sure to visit us online at leadershipbooks.store. There you'll find the works of some of the finest thought leaders today. And be sure to tune in here each week to gain even deeper insights from one of those leaders on the Compendium Podcast. <music> <laughs>